questions for this evening. Uh, dear Ajahn, question number one, is the recollection of past lives necessary? Uh, um, it depends what you want to ap achieve. Uh, yeah, so I guess, uh, is it necessary in, in what context? Is it necessary for enlightenment? Uh, uh, probably not absolutely necessary. You probably can get enlightened without recollecting past lives. Uh, but uh, uh, is it helpful? Maybe is a better w way to put it. Uh, is it helpful? Absolutely. Because uh, you see what is really going on and when you see the nature of reality, always good to have as much information as possible. Uh, then, uh, you know, it, it certainly helps you in the right direction. Uh, and uh, so, uh, yeah, so he helpful. So, uh, uh, is it good? Is it fun to see your past lives? <laughs> I guess it depends on what kind of past lives you had. <laughs> I th but usually, I think it's quite uh, sobering. I wouldn't say it's fun. It's more like sobering. Wow, this is what it is, uh, and it kind of gets you on the right track. Yeah. Number two, are the ten paramis a later addition? Uh, ten paramis are absolutely a later addition. Uh, in the Mahayana Buddhism they have the six paramis uh, and I think there was a uh, place in the Dhammapada or whatever where Bhikkhu Bodhi wrote an introduction to the Dhammapada translation and he was saying the Theravadans were trying to keep up with the Mahayanas. Uh, so the Mahayanas had six, the Theravadans were like, well if the Mahayana have six we can do better, we'll have ten instead. Uh, <laughs> something like that, I, I think that might be an exaggeration, but you know how these things are. Uh, uh, competing with the Joneses and, and, and all that. Uh. So they are later and they only occur in the commentaries. The word parami itself occurs in the suttas in a few places, but in, in a very, in a different meaning here. Uh. It doesn't, not in the meaning of the ten paramis, but more like as a high attainment or something like that. It's a very, it's a very different meaning, it doesn't, not in the same way. Uh. So the word is there, and that's very often the case that words may appear in the suttas and then later on they gain a different meaning and they are changed. So it's interesting, you know, you, when you hear a lot of traditional Buddhism, very often the word parami is used. They will talk about having to develop your paramis or you haven't got enough paramis from a past life and all of that, th those kind of things. But really, all of that, they are just, un they don't really know it very often, but they're actually using later Buddhist terminology to uh, explain the Dhamma. And uh, so, very often it is, you know, that's often how it is, because uh, um, in the popular, in, or in Buddhism, often these things are just merged together. People don't have that clarity of distinction between the suttas and the commentaries and later Buddhism. But uh, there's nothing in the suttas about paramis. Uh, when somebody says you haven't got enough paramis from a past life to practice, then doubt it. Uh, yeah, there is nothing like that in the suttas. Uh. Okay. If you are a human being, you have enough paramis from a past life. That's sufficient to know. If you are an animal, then you haven't got enough paramis from the past life. Uh, that is how you define it. <laughs> That's a simple way here. Yeah. Okay. Ajahn, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. That's the very first thing you said, that's really nice. It's st starting off with sadhu. Huh? <laughs> you even try, even, um, even, oh, it's from Yen. that's why you spelled it correctly. <laughs> okay. Number one, just to confirm, this is from uh, Sangyutta Nikaya 4850, the Apana Sutta. A Radhavirya energy roused is for the purpose of practicing right effort. Um, Sort of. Uh, yeah, I, maybe I'll read the whole thing, so maybe you're getting into something else. So the viri, virindria, the faculty of energy, is equal to right effort of a stream enterer, is that right? Uh, question mark. Uh, so, uh, virya and effort are not exactly the same thing. Virya means energy, right effort means um, putting effort into practice, it means actually cr almost like creating energy, using whatever energy you have. And these things are slightly different in the suttas, because when you use right effort, you have to apply yourself. Yeah? You kind of, you do things, whether you have the energy naturally or not, is not really the issue, but you apply yourself regardless to overcome the unwholesome and to develop the wholesome. Whereas virya, energy, is a naturally occurring energy in the mind. Yeah? 
So sometimes you feel energetic, you feel mentally energized, and the deeper your meditation is, the more energy you have in the mind. That is natural energy. Huh? So they are closely connected together, but when you have the natural energy, then the effort is quite automatic. Yeah, because your energy is there, it just happens. You don't have to use the willpower so much, you don't have to apply yourself, because it is there to be tapped into. So, but you are right, however, and this is precisely why in the five faculties that they use the word virya, whereas in the Noble Eightfold Path they use the word effort, padana. The one is energy, one is effort, and the reason why energy is used for the five faculties is because this is the, you know, sp precisely as you say, for the noble ones. Uh, yeah, and with the noble ones, uh, uh, the energy will tend to be there. They don't have to apply themselves so much, there will tend to be a natural energy of the mind. Yeah? That's just what it is for the noble people. And that's why there is a different vocabulary used. If you are an ordinary Putujana, that's when you have to apply effort. Once you become an Arya, it's called energy, because it happens more automatically. Yeah? So ideally, it's energy. But uh, for many, the reality of is often that you have to apply yourself. That's why it is effort instead. Uh. So, okay. And from Sangyutta Nikaya 48, 43, at Saketa, last, last year Sutta. <laughs> okay. Energy faculty becomes the power of energy, Virya Bala. They nourish each other. Then next is the Virya Sambojanga. So are you asking what the difference is between all of these things? I, I don't think there is all that much difference. Of course, Virya energy changes over time. Yeah, and and as you develop it, you become you become even more energetic. But usually, when you see the word Virya, it is when it starts to arise in the mind. Yeah. So, for example, with the stream enter, you have, you have the faith, and from the faith, once the stream enter reflects on the Dhamma, the energy comes straight out of the faith. This is why faith is so powerful, or confidence is so powerful, because that gladness and joy that you have always brings energy with it. In the suttas, you find these three factors going around each other, the virya, the pamuja, the gladness yeah, of the mind, and the sati, these always come together. When you are glad because of the Dhamma, you feel energized, natural energy is there. When you have natural energy and you're glad, you become mindful because it's nice to be present. Uh, so these things kind of merge together into a very beautiful package. Uh, yeah, it's a package, package deal, is that right? <laughs> it's a good package, it's a Buddha's package deal. You get these kind of special holiday packages to Nibbana, whatever it is, uh, this is what is going on there. Uh. So, and this is the same thing with the virya in the bojangas, because it starts off with sati, sati sambojanga, then you have the dhammavichya sambojanga, then they have the virya sambojanga. Is that right? No, that's not in the sambojanga. Am I correct about that? Yes? I'm getting confused now. Why am I getting confused? That's uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Is it, is it is it correct? Yeah. And then from the virya comes the piti, and then from the piti comes the basadi, basadi comes the samadhi, samadhi comes the upeka, right? Okay, uh, I think that's, that's, that is right. Uh, okay. So all of these things are there, and the virya is usually talked about fairly early on, so that's what it means, the early virya, then it becomes more powerful. As you go up through those bojangas, the higher up you go, you bring the lower qualities with you, so you bring the virya with you, except that it becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. Huh? And uh, like Ajahn Brahm says, when you come out of a jhana state, you feel like a nuclear reactor. That's a lot of energy, right? Uh, big, so you, you just hope you don't explode, because it's bad for everyone. Everyone. Uh, radiation. But maybe, it's a maybe it's a good radiation. You radiate out all this beautiful energy. I, I don't know. I'm messing around a bit now, because uh, I just, I'm an Ajahn Brahm disciple. You've got to mess around a little bit, otherwise you, you may not stay in the monastery. <laughs> Anyway, does that make sense, uh, Wayen? Where are you? There you are. Okay, well, suddenly. If, okay, okay, something like that. But do you have another question? What else did you ask Ashanganha? <laughs> okay, what did I ask Ashanganha? This is kind of interesting because uh, one of the things uh, I you realize even when you are in the presence of arahants is that they 
also have their personality, they have their inclination, they look at things in a certain way. And uh, sometimes when I heard some of the things that he said, I disagreed with him. It was very interesting because uh, can you really disagree with an arahant? Well, you can disagree with an arahant. You cannot disagree with the fundamentals of the Buddhist practice. But there are many things that are not to do with the fundamentals, and then you can actually disagree. So I, I asked him. I asked him a simple question. I said, "Well, what about the reading of the suttas? Is that important? This is interesting, isn't it? Uh, what do you think about reading the suttas?" And he said, "Ah, oh, don't read anything. Just practice." And that goes so against what I believe in. Yeah, it's so completely contrary to what how I think about the Dharma. So what I did, I wasn't going to be satisfied with that. There was no way I was going to be satisfied with that answer. So I was going to press him a little bit. And this is the nice thing about being a, quite a senior monk. You're not so scared of these other senior monks. You, you even the, if they have a reputation for being an arahant, still you dare to kind of push them a little bit. Yeah, not to be satisfied with an answer. So uh, I, I wasn't really afraid of him because, as I said before, he's so kind anyway. There's no way he's going to do anything bad or anything like that. So I felt completely safe in pushing him a little bit. And also, not being a Thai, you're given more leeway to act badly, you know, that kind of stuff. So, and of course, I looked at myself, I asked myself, am I coming from a wholesome place or am I just want to argue with him? And it felt that I was doing the right thing, so it was, it was okay. So I said to him, well, if you look at the origin of the forest tradition in Thailand, uh, when Ajahn Man was around, uh, he was the first one. There wasn't any forest monks before him. Uh. So when he had his insights, when he had his samadhi experiences, uh, the only person that he could talk to was a scholar monk called Chao Kun Upali, who was his fri uh, friend from lay life. Uh. So it's, it's a well-known story that Ajahn Man, uh, he went to Bangkok to check with this famous scholar monk who was very high up in the Thai Sangha hierarchy to discuss with him his meditation experiences. Yeah, isn't that kind of fascinating? He went to a scholar monk to discuss his meditation experiences and based on that feedback he got from this scholar monk he was actually able to follow the path all the way to the end. So I said to Arangana, oh, what do you think about that? This is the beginning of the forest tradition. The forest tradition is based on the suttas. Without the suttas, there wouldn't be a forest tradition. That's what it means, yeah? That's basically what it means, that's what it comes down to. And uh, then he replied to me. Adhan Khan had replied to me, he said, oh, that was in the past. <laughs> it's not a very good answer, right? Because it's still the reality, this is what happened. Okay, it may be in the past, but still, the suttas were used to re-establish the forest tradition, to re-establish awakening, to re-establish the understanding of these things. So at that point I realized, you don't always have to take what these forest masters say a hundred percent. You have to understand the conditioning that they have and what kind of why they say the things they do. And the reason why Ajahn Gandha would say something like that was because at the time of Ajahn Shah, because he's a disciple of Ajahn Shah, he's a nephew, Ajahn Shah's nephew, and uh, when he was with Ajahn Shah, Ajahn Shah rejected all scholarship, and the reason was because the scholarship they had in Thailand in those days was not really sutta based It was scholarship that was done, that did the Dhammapada, Atakata, which is just stories, yeah? They do Abhidhamma studies, very, very little suttas. So all the scholarship was really, not really relevant for practice usually. So Ajahn Shah and many of those teachers, they realized it's not really relevant, why are we studying this? Just throw it out. And then they had this anti kind of book and scholar tradition as part of a large part of the forest tradition. And that is what, how Ajahn Ganha grew up with that kind of, you know, environment. And because Ajahn Ganha is a very simple monk, he's been to school, he went to school for four years, that's it. I don't know, he, he probably can read and write, but not probably not all that well even, yeah, after four years of schooling, it's not that much. Uh, he doesn't really, his horizons of the world is fairly limited, and that teaching he got from Ajahn Shah is what carries on, and that is kind of where he's coming from. Uh, so once you understand where he's coming from, it makes sense what he's saying. Yeah, then you can understand why he says that. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it necessarily relates to our situation. Uh, that is important to understand. 
So I went back to Ajahn Brahm and I told him this story. Uh, and, <laughs> and Ajahn Brahm thought it was quite funny. <laughs> But uh, so this is how you so you you meet these monks and you you still have to use your own judgment, yeah. You can't just allow uh, follow these monks blindly because sometimes they too look at the world in a different way from what uh, what we do. Huh? And this is uh, this that was one example of that. Uh, so uh, a lot of the things he says, of course, when it comes to pure dhamma things, are actually very nice and very beautiful and very useful. Huh? It was another interesting encounter, that I, I, another interesting exchange. In the evening, as Ganha would always come down uh, and he would sit with the lay people and sit with the whole group and I would also often come out and when, when I came out he would always sit me next to him. Yeah? And he's very, kind of very charming and you sit next to him and he does smiles at you and then he kind of pats you on the shoulder and he does all these kind of very, very nice things. But, and so we're sitting there and we were discussing things and while he was discussing with the lay people, I was thinking some questions I wanted to ask. Yeah, yeah? and one of the questions I thought of, I, I would say, I will, you know, because he's so beaming and radiant, but at the same time he's quite old, not particularly quite fat, yeah, and not very, quite ugly in that sense. So I wanted to ask him, well, how come, you know, you're getting old now, Lumpur, yeah? Lumpur is kind of a honorific way of saying grandfather, but you're getting quite old now, a bit fat, you know, a bit ugly. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I, I really wanted to say that, but but you are still the most beautiful person here. Why is that? Uh, yeah, I wanted to say to say a little bit about this practice, maybe or something like that. Uh, that's what I wanted to say. Is I was I was thinking about this question, uh, and uh, while he was talking to the other people, and as I'm thinking about this question, he's turned. There's an old woman sitting up on the other side of him, uh, qu really quite old, and also you know looking like she's not that far away from death perhaps, I don't know her. And so he turns to this old woman and he says to her, oh, you know, even though you're old and ugly, you can still be beautiful inside. <laughs> 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 and so I thought, gee, I thought, what's going on here? <laughs> what is happening, yeah? So, so later on, I, I asked his upatak, his kind of his, uh, uh, you know, his uh, person who looks after Ajangana, well, what, was, what happened there? I asked him. And his upatak, who knows Ajangana really well, said, I don't know what happened. I never heard him say anything like that before. Uh, yeah, he doesn't say that. Uh, so then the conversation continued. And then I, I asked Ajangana, I said, well, um, I was just thinking this thought. And then you asked this question, uh, you know, are you. Is this just a coincidence, or are you reading my mind? I, I asked this publicly, yeah, because I said I'm not really afraid, yeah. So I, I asked this publicly, yeah. and then uh, he uh, refused to answer. He said, "Oh, never mind, never mind," and he carried on. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite interesting, yeah, because it was so. It was quite specific. I got this feeling at that point that maybe he's reading my mind. That was the feeling. That kind of made me a little bit more worried afterwards. I have to admit. <laughs> So there was a number of other questions that I would have liked to ask, but never really got the opportunity, yeah, or I didn't feel natural. There yeah, are some questions that were a bit more controversial, perhaps. Uh, so I have, and now I have good reasons for going another trip to Ajanganha to ask him these other controversial questions. Uh, so I will tell you what he says when I come back next time, when I have talked to him, see what, <laughs> see what comes of that. Uh, but we had long conversations about all kinds of things, but most of the time, because he's so senior, he just talks. Yeah? Most of the time you just listen to what he says. Uh, otherwise it would be very uh, rude to interrupt him all the time. So that's, uh, that's, kind of, that's, that's okay, that's nice. It's nice just to listen, because uh, it comes from a very peaceful and nice place. Anyway, that's a little bit about the things I talk to Ajahn Ganha about. Uh, okay. <coughs> Which level of jhana has Ajahn Brahm attained? <laughs> Which level of jhana has Ajahn Brahmali attained? Okay. <laughs> what was the cheekiest question that Ajahn Brahmali asked of Ajahn Ganha? Well, you have some idea about the cheekiest question there. Which level of Jhana has Ajahn Brahm attained? Well, I, you, you can kind of guess, pretty high, yeah? Pretty, pretty up there. His, his, his Ajahn Brahm is kind of no, when it comes to jhanas, he's pretty good. Uh, probably one of the best jhana meditators around uh, is Ajahn Brahm. Uh, Ajahn Brahmali, well, you have to ask someone else. I can't really, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get onto that one. Uh, so uh, we'll leave that one to one side uh, and uh, 
yeah. I don't really, you, just to give you a little bit of background in case you don't know, is that monks don't really talk about their own attainments. In fact, it is a, it is a, uh, there's a rule against that in the monastic code, so we don't talk about those things. And even talking about other monk attainments is a bit strange, because sometimes when you start talking about people's attainments, you get into competition, who has the most attainments, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, just be inspired by what you see. If you see something good, be inspired. Yeah? When you see Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn Ganda, be inspired by that. That's good enough. And then if you see good things, have confidence. If you see bad things, then you don't have to have so much confidence. That is the best way to think about these things. Otherwise, there's endlessly, endless one-upmanship and it never takes any, comes to no end. Okay. Dear Ajahn, is it true that one can be a stream mentor by studying and listening or teaching the Dhamma, that is with no meditation? And the answer to that is no. Uh, there is a sutta that you're probably referring to in the Anguttara Fives or something. It talks about the five uh, pancha vimutayatana, the five kind of bases of uh, liberation. And there, it, uh, if you read that sutta, it may look as if that is what is happening. But if you read it very carefully, what it says is that it says, as you are teaching the Dhamma, or as you are listening to the Dhamma, yeah, that's what, that is where it starts out, uh, then you go through this whole sequence that leads to Samadhi before you have liberation. So it begins with listening to the Dhamma, but still the whole sequence is there that takes you to samadhi and then liberation happens as a consequence of the samadhi. So it is true that listening to the Dhamma is the trigger, but that trigger leads to the ordinary sequence of, uh, of mental state that is required for samadhi to arise and then liberation can happen. Yeah? So that can happen if you teach the Dhamma, if you listen, if you just recite the Dhamma, yeah, if you're just learning the Dhamma, or it can happen through ordinary meditation practice, watching the breath or whatever. The Panchavimuttayatana, I think it's called that sutta. Uh, but the, you always, the whole process is there. You cannot avoid going into samadhi. That is always part of this, uh, uh, part and parcel of this. And then the outcome is liberation on the other end. Yes? What about Sadhana Nusari? Sadhana Nusari? Um, yes, I think with a sadhana nusari, maybe less samadhi is required, yeah? But I would probably, we may actually be able to be a sadhana nusari without a jhana, perhaps. Uh, but I think still some degree of, uh, at least some degree of meditation probably is, you need some kind of mental cultivation, yeah? You need to kind of get rid of the defilements. You can't have any defilements to be a sadhana nusari. Uh, so you have some kind of mental cultivation going there, so very likely that would include some meditation practice. Uh, but maybe you can be without jhana experience. Uh. Mm. Okay, dear Arjan, what, okay, what, <laughs> again about Arjan Ganha again. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so, <coughs> I'll tell you more stories about him next time. See what, see what happens. Okay, I sometimes get hot while meditating and was told before that uh, it's because of guilt. What is your thoughts on this? Thank you. It's because of guilt. Okay. Um, I don't know, maybe. I, I, I don't know what, 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 what the reason is. Uh, there can be all kinds of reasons why you feel hot, but uh, very often when you know <coughs> you close your eyes and you try to meditate uh, perception can play all kind of tricks on you uh, you can feel all kind of strange things and heat is probably one of them uh, you can feel cold or you can feel you're expanding or you're floating in the air and all of this kind of stuff is quite common uh, could maybe also be related to a defilement maybe i don't know it's hard i can't really tell so what you have to do is try to investigate uh, so if you do have some things that you feel guilty about, then try to let go of the guilt. Yeah? Forgive yourself, forgive other people, whatever it is. Know that you are a bit like a robot. Robots don't usually have guilt. So if you are a robot, just become a bit more like a robot and let go of the guilt. 
and then you should be on the right track. Remember that it's a very useful thing to remember that it feels like we are so independent and that we make independent choices and that's why we feel guilty about things because we feel it's my responsibility, I did wrong, I made the mistake. And the more you see how conditioned you are as a person uh, and how little control you really have over your actions and thoughts and speech and all of these things and how conditioned it all is, uh, the more you realize you are more like a robot. And the more you see that, you can forgive yourself. Uh, I was like this because of all this conditioning. Uh, all of these people conditioned me in a certain way. I was angry and upset and things were difficult, so I did something stupid. Uh, whatever the reason is, uh, and that is why you did it. Uh, not because you really wanted to be a, a bad person or do something wrong. Uh, so be kind to yourself. Uh, understand your conditioning. Uh, understand where it all is coming from. Uh, and then uh, let go of that guilt, if there is guilt there. Uh, but uh, investigate it yourself. Don't ask other people too much about these things, because other people don't really understand you all that much. Yeah. So don't uh, follow that blindly, whatever advice you were given by somebody. Find out why. Look at these things more carefully here. Huh? And you should be able to find out. Uh, sometimes just stay with the heat. Okay, you get hot. Uh, then stay with it and see where it takes you. Huh? Eventually it may just disappear again. Yeah, it may be a temporary thing. A lot of these perceptions that we have in meditation, they come and then they go. Huh? Maybe you are putting in too much effort. Try to sit in a more relaxed posture. Huh? Yeah, lean back against something, sit on a chair, lie down, do something else and see if the heat comes up in any kind of posture you use. Maybe it won't come up in other postures. So experiment a little bit yeah, and see, see how these things kind of, uh, see what happens as a consequence. In this way, investigate the problem, try to find the root. There usually is a reason and if there is no reason then you don't have to worry about it and it's just a perception which arises for random, for pretty much random reasons. Okay, you mentioned regret being one of the biggest hindrances. How do you uncover and remove these when some of them could, is possibly buried deep down and unknown even to yourself? Yes, sometimes they can be buried deep down. Yes, sometimes we can carry regret even from past lives. And this is one of those interesting things about sometimes you have this past life regression uh, and you uncover things in your past life and sometimes when you see those things in the past life suddenly boom it's all gone because you understand the cause. Uh, so sometimes these things can have like a medical advantage, Yeah, you can kind of free yourself mentally from problems that you have simply by sometimes by seeing your past lives, presuming that the past life regression is, the, is a real one. Uh, but uh, the way you uncover it, you don't actually need to uncover it. Uh, you just need to generally forgive yourself for everything. Yeah, Understanding more that you are a robot, uh, not, not that you are literally a robot, but that you are robot-like. Yeah, and We have these habits and things carrying on. And if you forgive yourself in a very more general sense, then these things, even the things you did in the past life, will gradually fade yeah, and disappear as a consequence. Uh, so don't actually have to uncover it. The idea of uncovering things is more of a modern psychology idea, that when you uncover things, you can deal with them. But in Buddhism, we try instead to transcend things. That's even more powerful than uncovering it. Sometimes you may have to uncover a little bit or to f deal with things that are obvious because uh, they are too big as blockages. You can't really transcend them. And then, of course, you forgive and you let go. But uh, often, if it is so deeply buried in the past, uh, you can often transcend it. So just keep practicing here. Uh, keep living well. Generally forgive yourself. Generally understand your own conditioning here. Uh, and as you do so, you're enlarging that pond, that pool of water gets larger and larger and larger. And the salt gets smaller and smaller by comparison. Yeah, That famous simile of the lump of salt in the water. So as you do that, it gradually just fades away until it sort of evaporates completely. Uh, and then you are okay here, yeah? and you don't really have a problem with it anymore. Yeah? So uh, if I were you, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Uh, I don't know you, so I don't know how big this problem is uh, with you and, and, uh, and all of that, uh, but that is, would be my normal kind of answer to this kind of question. Uh. So uh, 
Yes. Okay. This is the last question for tonight. There were many questions, but they were all about Ajahn Ganhas. They were all kind of one answer. <laughs> okay, so this one also is about Ajahn Ganha. Yeah? The last one. What inspired and what is his answer? Thank you. Huh? And um, things about Ajahn Ganha is that uh, when you ask him questions, usually he answers in very simple, simple ways. I remember when I was there, visited him last time, not this time, but the time before. Uh, I asked him about metta practice, uh, how to, you know, to be kind, how to have metta to other people. And I kind of expected him to give a nice answer about how to meditate and how to direct your mind and how to kind of wish everyone well. But of course not. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what these arahants don't give you answers like that. Uh, so he gave a very practical answer. He said that when you wake up in the morning, you should ask yourself, what good can I do for the world today? Uh, that's how you have metta. It's beautiful, isn't it? Uh, it's so simple. We tend to make metta into something we do in meditation practice, and we forget that the real metta is practiced outside of meditation. The metta builds up on how we treat people around us. And this is actually what it says in the suttas, the Kosambhya Sutta. It specifically says that you start off with metta in action and speech, then metta in thought, how you think about people, and then maybe you do kind of metta meditation. So this is how it starts out, but often we forget that. Uh, and many people, they're not all that good at practicing metta in daily life. They go to straight to the meditation. Uh, it's not going to work. Uh, first of all, we need to learn how to have metta to people in ordinary life, how to treat each other well. Uh, that is the first one. Uh. So practice metta throughout the day, yeah, throughout the day, towards everyone. Uh. How can you be kind to people in speech? Uh, how can you be kind to people in action? Uh. That is what it's like. Uh. Remember the Buddhist ideas of gentle speech and harmonious speech and all these kind of things. Uh, and when you remember this all the time, then uh, uh, it becomes very powerful. Remember the influence you have on other people. Uh, other people really feel your actions and speech. Uh, you have so many opportunities to give people gifts through your speech and through your actions by treating them with a gentle and kind way. Uh, this is what he t is talking about. He was talking a lot about speech when I met him this time, how we should speak to each other in the right way. Yeah? Simple things uh, about right speech and dealing with each other uh, in that way. Uh. So he gives very simple teachings. Uh. He doesn't talk much about meditation at all. Uh. And uh, you can see why. The reason is because someone like Ajahn Ganha, he just sits down, yeah? he closes his eyes, uh, and off he is. Uh. That's all he has to do. Uh. It's nice, isn't it? Uh, and the reason that is because his mind is so pure. There's nothing. He doesn't need to watch the breath, kind of bang, just goes into nimittas and off into jhanas. Yeah, it, that's all he has, you know, because the mind is already so pure. He is very rare. There's very few people like that in the whole world who, who are like that. Most of us, we have to do much more to get rid of those defilements that are blocking us. But for him, he just lies down, uh, often he lies down when he meditates. Uh, when he was in Perth, we, he, he said, oh, you, when you meditate, just lie down. Uh, and, uh, well, but, uh, you know, what do you, what do you do then, we asked him, when you lie down? You do nothing, he said. Uh, but if you don't do anything, wouldn't, don't you fall asleep? No, that would be doing something. Uh. <laughs> so he's just mindful, he's just aware, yeah, nothing happens. Uh. And that's kind of, it's, it's, so, so, it's so easy. And the reason why he's able to do that is precisely because he has put in a lot of effort in the preliminaries, and he still does that. That is where good meditation comes out of. It shows you how the basic parts of the path actually are the most important ones. If you are consistently kind in the way you act, the way you think, consistently generous, uh, consistently caring of other people, then you become so pure inside of you that suddenly meditation is just so easy. Uh. The reason why it is hard is precisely because we're lacking that purity. Uh. So don't strive too hard in your meditation. It's not striving that is the problem. It's not a lack of effort that is the problem. The problem is a lack of purity in the mind. Uh. So that's why, just relax instead, enjoy the little peace that you have. That is really the right way, because regardless of how you strive, it's not going to make that much difference. People often ask, what am I doing wrong in my meditation? Yeah, it doesn't work. What am I doing wrong? What is the method? What should I be doing? 
It's got nothing to do with what you're doing. It's the meditation is the simplest thing in the world. You just have to watch the breath. How, much, how many different ways are there of watching the breath? There's not that many different ways. Uh, just watching the breath, for goodness sake, anyone can do that. Uh, you can be, you know, uh, no, I'm not going to go there. <coughs> but so it's simple, yeah? And the reason it doesn't work is not because the method is wrong or the, or the way you watch the breath is wrong or should I watch it upside down or which, what should I do? That is not the point. Uh, the point is the purity of the mind. So you always have to come back to that. How do you purify these things so that meditation becomes pretty much automatic? Yeah. And then you're on the right track. That's why you're an arahant, you close your eyes, bang, you go into a jhana state. Uh, that's why if you ask Ajahn Brahm about meditation, he would, Ajahn Brahm will say, oh, you don't actually have to watch the breath. That's what Ajahn Brahm says these days. No need to watch the breath, yeah? You just sit back, close your eyes, you just wait and wait, and then the nimitta comes up, and bang, into jhana. <laughs> That's what they says, yeah? So what are you going to say? <laughs> you know? And this is how, when you are very skilled in, the, not skilled, it's got nothing to do with skill, it has to do with development of the mind. That's kind of the point about all this. Uh. Anyway, so I'm going to call it a night. So I wish you all a good night, and please carry on meditating and enjoying yourself. Don't forget to enjoy yourself. Have a good rest, and we'll see you again tomorrow morning here.